16 today. And it's a wonderfully, wonderfully clear exposition, really, of the revelation of God. Now, the first thing we're told is that it is a psalm of David. You know, if you see there in verse 1, it's a psalm of David. And we have to remember who David is at this point. You know, he was a, a young shepherd boy. Um, just imagine him in the countryside, um, outside um, his father's town, just letting the sheep go and pasture. And every night, covering himself up and staring up at the sky and looking up at all the stars that are out there. You remember, this is, this is the time before light pollution. You know, this isn't London 2017. You know, when you look up, the stars fill the sky. And as he walk the fields with the, with the sheep, you know, th- again, this isn't like the Welsh or the Scottish countryside where everything's fenced off. No, no, like David was wandering everywhere with the sheep. Wherever there is great pasture, there he is. You know, if anyone knew the countryside in Judea, David knew it. He would have known you know, the wonders of God's natural revelation. He, he saw it every day. And I think it's so easy, isn't it, for us who live in London in 2017 to miss this. You know, we're surrounded by great man-made structures. And we forget that actually behind them stand an almighty and powerful God who created us, who then created these things. And it's so easy for us to celebrate our own accomplishments rather than the accomplishments of God. And then secondly, you know, David was the king. You know, at this point in his life, he was probably in Jerusalem. Um, he'd been inaugurated as king. And you can just imagine, you know, because one of the first things that a good king, a good righteous king was supposed to do according to Deuteronomy anyways, is to sit down and make a copy of the Bible on his own. Just handwrite it all. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had to sit down and copy something out, I would know it way better than if I just kind of read it. And so there was no really no more diligent student of God's word than David was. And you can imagine him, you know, just... Remembering his time as a, as a young shepherd boy and thinking of the greatness of God in his general revelation. And then as he writes out God's word day after day. And for him to just put down whatever it is that he would have written with and just think, wow, isn't God amazing? That he reveals himself in nature and he reveals himself in his word. So often we miss this. And, you know, I know I'm guilty of this. You know, living in North London, it's green, it's nice. But I miss being able to go into the countryside and appreciate that raw beauty that God has put on earth for us. And being immersed in God's word day in, day out, in the technicalities of Hebrew grammar or Greek grammar and, you know, important but nonetheless obscure systematic theology or biblical theology. So often I, I, you know, I I just forget that actually God reveals himself as the covenant Lord in his word. And this, prepping this was a great reminder for me that actually God's revelation is so much more than just little technical bits. That he desires us to desire his word. And we're shown numerous things about his revelation here that we are going to go through today. So firstly then we're going to have a look at the wonder of his general revelation. And that's from verses 1 to um, 6. Um, And we're going to see three things, essentially, from here about his general revelation. And firstly, then, we're going to see that it's unlimited. 
Look at this on verse, in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. And then in verse 4, their voices goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. God's general revelation proclaims his glory to the whole world. And so nobody living on this planet right now has any excuse not to come to God. And surely then that should give us so much more willingness and desire and initiative to go out to tell people the gospel because they are a people without excuse. The second thing we see is that these things, the, the, the general revelation is without ceasing. Verse 2, day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. God's revelation of himself in general revelation, in his natural world. The things that he proclaims because he has created the earth. These things are proclaimed day after day, night after night. Which means that the people that came before us, they had the same revelation. And you know, for me, I come from Taiwan. The gospel didn't get there for thousands of years. And it means that my ancestors missed out on the chances of being saved. How much more then should we be thinking about our future generations? You know, the, if, if these revelations are without ceasing and they're the same from the beginning of time to the end of time, how much more then should we be thinking about how it is that we can best serve the people who are coming after us? How can we explain the gospel to them so that they may be saved? But thirdly, we see that these things are unheard. Verse 3. There is no speech, nor there are their words, but their voice is not heard. As great and as wonderful God's general revelation is, as, you know, when, if we stand on the top of the mountain, we know, don't we, that there is something greater and bigger than us. As we sit under a big canopy of stars, we know that we are but a small, insignificant speck in creation. And th- there's a sense of there must be a creator out there. And yet, people deny it. We read that from Romans 1 earlier. God's general revelation proclaims his glory to all the world, to all time, and yet it is unheard. And we see this especially in the work of the sun. S-U-N, not S-O-N. We see this in verses 5 and 6. The sun bursts forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuits to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Do you see how encompassing this imagery of the sun as a part of general revelation is? Nothing is hidden from its heat. And we know, doesn't it, don't we, the, the sun goes in a, well, we go around the sun. But nonetheless, the sun is continuously with us. It is hung there in the sky, just proclaiming God's glory day after day after day. And when it's not proclaiming it to our side of the world, it's proclaiming it to the other side of the world. God's general revelation is continuous and unlimited, and yet it is unheard. The psalmist chose the sun as an example of God's general revelation very specifically for this purpose. Because the sun, in their time and age, in their time and space, was frequently worshipped by the nations around them. 
Now, even now, we know that the Greeks worshipped Apollo, the Greek god. And actually, when you look at all the cultures in the world, there is space for the sun god because it's just there. It's magnificence. You know, people naturally drawn to it. Of course, it's greater and bigger than us, but it is not the ultimate thing that we should worship. The, the irony drips thick in this. The psalmist knows everybody worships the sun, and yet the sun is worship, and, and yet the sun is created by the great and almighty God that we worship, and the Israelites and the psalmist worshipped at this point. And so even the son's voice, even as he proclaims the glory of God, that is ignored and unheard. And people chase after the son rather than the God who who, who created it. And actually, are we so different? We We can laugh at them for being so ridiculous, sure. But are we really that different? You know, how often do we chase after things that are not God? How often do we worship things that are not God? That are either made by God or made by us? You know, we are not exempt from the accusations of Romans 1 that we've just read. Now, if God's general revelation is unlimited is unceasing and yet unheard. What hope can we possibly have? What hope can we possibly have to get to know God? Well, we see this in the second part of the psalm, in his special revelation, in that God talks to us. He gives us particular laws and his covenant For us to follow so that we may know him and his will for us. And we see this in verses 7 and 7 to to, um, to 11. And again, we're going to see three things. Uh, We're going to see how um, the special revelation functions in the life of his people. And then we're going to see the value of the special revelation. And then finally, we're going to see a response to God's special revelation for us. So firstly then, the function of the special revelation. In verse 7, we see the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Now, in, in, in these verses, we see six particular things that kind of point us to what the law is. And they're, they're all, all six things, you know, the law... Uh, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the fear, and the rules of the Lord. You know, th- these are just saying the same thing, really. They're just saying, okay, this is the word of God. But intriguingly, what we're told is what it does for people. So the first thing we see then, that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So the law of the Lord, when we encounter it, There's something about it that makes us turn and repent. And we realize that we've gone wrong and that we should turn to the Lord. And that is the process of reviving the soul. The second thing we see here is that the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, that is a strange thing to say, isn't it? You know, why would some book that was written thousands of years ago be able to make us wise? You know, why, why, why would David, why should David be considered wiser than us? I mean, after all, we are a great civilization these days, aren't we? You know, we're able to make iPads, um, we've got these wireless mics. You know, to David, this would have looked like sorcery. And yet, what he says here is that the Bible can make wise the simple. Now, the fact of the matter is, you can be extremely clever and you can do a lot of very clever things and be a total fool. 
if you don't know, if you can't see the world as it truly is. And because from the Bible, we know that God created the world and he is the one that sustains it. And he is the one that tells us what he wants us to do. If we completely ignore that fundamental fact about our existence, if we just ignore that, then no matter how clever we think we are, we are just fools. And yet, if for for even the most, for the least intellectual of us, if we come to the Lord, if we see these things to be true and we trust them, we are wiser than those who are intellectually superior to us. Isn't that amazing? What a great equalizer this is. And the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Now, again, we have to remember the world that David lived in. You know, all the nations worship different gods. And even within the nations, they have hundreds and thousands of different gods. And so each and every day, they had to try to negotiate exactly, you know, what does each god want? And it meant that they had to hold everything in tension. But isn't that also true for us? You know, each and every day, we're bombarded by different sorts of thought, philosophy, um, concepts. And for so many of us living in this time, in this place, we're confused, aren't we? And so often we're just being lied to, aren't we? Yeah, just scrolling through on your Facebook page, there are just hundreds of adverts for things that you don't need. Watching TV, just you're bombarded by lots of things and all of them trying to manipulate you somehow. And actually what ends up happening is that you start putting your guards up. You start thinking, I just don't want to believe in anything anymore. You become a total skeptic. And at that point then, your heart is hardened to the rest of the world. And actually we, we, we kind of see this sometimes, just, just even in marriage. Um, you know, if, if, if I'm having an argument with, with, with my wife, um, and she feels like I should just kind of instinctively know what is wrong. And she's like, well, you know, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. That, that, what, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, that, it, my, my heart does not rejoice at that, at that point. But then if she was to turn around and say, well, Ashley Song, you're a sinner and this is, this is sort of what I think is going on. And, you know, and we have an open conversation about it. Then, you know, yes, it's difficult. It's hard. And it's hard being told those things. But at the end of it, my heart rejoices because she's made me a better man. And, um, and, and you know, we, we've, we've hashed it out. The relationship is, is restored because of her rightness, her truthfulness to me. And then the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now, um, the ESV here says that the, the, the commandments of the Lord is pure, but the NIV um, probably more helpfully puts it that the, the commandments of the Lord is radiant, enlightening the eyes. And what's going on there is that basically the, the, the laws of the Lord gives us a right perspective on the world. You know, he is the one that created all things. He is the one that has given us everything. And so when he tells us what to think of a particular, of a particular event or um, just anything, then actually that completely opens our eyes to the truthfulness of that, doesn't it? And then fifthly, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. This one in particular, should leap straight out at the, from the page at us. 
Now, so far, we've been talking about the law of the Lord as it's been written. But out of the blue, David is talking about the fear of the Lord. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's something that's created within us. And then he tells us that it's enduring forever. This is bizarre, isn't it? That the fear of the Lord somehow is connected with the law of God and that it endures forever. You know, could it be that even David at this point, as he's been diligently studying the word of God, he knows that actually faith itself, the fear of the Lord, can only come as a gift from God. That it is a part of his special revelation. And not only that, he, he has a sort of a little glimpse into what the gospel really means, what the Bible really means for us, what the fear of the Lord really means for us. That the fear of the Lord, it would last forever. Now, if the fear of the Lord lasts forever, then there needs to be people who fear the Lord who lasts forever. You know, could it be that actually even here David is glimpsing something of the eternal nature of what it would be mean, what would what would, would it mean for us if we feared the Lord? Oh, that's incredible, isn't it? And finally, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, the ESV here says righteous altogether and i think for for us um as english speakers in england right now we can get the sense that you know something that is righteous altogether just means really really righteous i I don't know what 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 it would be for americans or if you're speaking as a second language but i think we we tend to get the sense that it just means oh you know really really righteous but actually what it's talking about here is that it's righteous taken as a whole Gather together as a group, as a body of laws. It is all together in a group righteous. Nothing about the word of God contradicts itself. It is a complete system and it is all true. And this, this should be contrasted by the philosophies of our age. I mean, how often do you talk to people who just believe everything under the sun and they have no idea how they all hang together? You know, I, I remember just even as I, before I became a Christian, I was an absolutely devout atheist. I, I you know, I, I was just so convinced that God couldn't exist and evolution basically just explained everything to me. And yet, I loved art. I loved music. I loved the virtues that people have. Bravery, um, altruism, all those things. And it was the fact that I could see that those two things are incompatible. You know, if evolution is all that there was, if everything was just geared towards survival of the fittest, the first ape that picked up a paintbrush to try to make a living out of it would have starved to death. The first brave ape who kind of throws himself in front of his friends to save them, dead. I mean, it's genetically unviable because that kind of stuff would be immediately bred out of the system. Realistically, if evolution is all we've got, and God didn't create any of us, then these virtues should not exist after allegedly millions of years of evolution. We should be cruel. We should be foul. And yet we're not. And it's important to ask, why not? And, you know, we see that there's all these sort of contradicting philosophies out there. And all of us just kind of imbibe them, don't we? we? We live in it. And we don't stop to think that actually these things are incompatible. And in contrast then, God's law is totally compatible with one another. And the thing is, when when 
your entire basics for looking out at the world is just jumbled and confused. Actually, it's a horrible feeling because somewhere inside, you know that these things are not right. You know that there is something out there that should settle you. Now, psychologists call this um, a, a cognitive dissonance. That the things that you believe and the realities of the world just, just don't quite match up. And, you know, in, in sort of human terms, David is saying here that if you're a Christian, if you are a diligent student of God's word, this won't exist. Because you are able to know what you believe because God has taught it to you truthfully. You are able to look at the world and know exactly what it means. And then you'll know that actually all of this hangs together in harmony. And that, that should give us great joy. The fact that we can be protected like this in an age of just confusion. That should give us great joy. And we see here, don't we, that you know, we're to respond by loving the word of God. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. You know, we're in London. There's a lot of money here. And we know what money can do. But there is no amount of money in the world that that can replace the kind of sureness of being able to know the world and know God. Nothing is more precious than that. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. This should be sweet in our mouths. And, you know, we, we kind of look at honey and honeycomb. And again, easy, it's easy for our, in our context to kind of miss, miss this. In David's time, there is no, there are no artificial sweetness. You know, refined sugar didn't exist. Um, if they wanted anything sweet, all they've got is fruit and honey. Honey is the sweetest thing that was available to David at the time. And not only that, he, talk, he talks about the drippings of the honeycomb. Now, I don't know, has anybody been to a farmer's market and sort of picked up a, a bit of honeycomb? I mean, it's actually really tasty. I, I think it's more tasty than sort of any artificial sweets that we've ever come up with. But when you pick up the honeycomb, you're kind of just going, that looks disgusting. You know, it's all crusty, and you know, you're kind of picking bits of bee out of it before you eat it. Um, but this isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about the dripping, that, that first initial harvest of honey out of the honeycomb. You know, this is the sweetest, most undiluted, natural goodness that he could have possibly received. That is how sweet the Lord's words are to him. And then we should respond by loving it. Verse 11, moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. You know, we tend to think that sort of the good things of life, the, 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 the sort of really good things that God promises us, it's going to come in heaven, in, in the new heavens and the new earth. When we're resurrected, we're living with God, and wouldn't that be brilliant? And yet, what David says here is that even just by keeping God's word... You know, that in of itself is a great reward. You know, it, it's back to the honey imagery. Just eating the honey itself is a great reward. I mean, yes, your body is nourished and great goodness comes to you through it. But eating the honey, that's the treat. So actually, for Christians, the treat of our life now is in keeping God's word and to know it. And here is why. Because in his word, we can be declared from innocent faults, verse 12, and then we can be kept 
away from presumptuous sins. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? That we can be declared, declared innocent and then kept from presumptuous sins. I mean, in a way, David is being, you know, if we're being undiscerning about how we're reading this text, we can think, we can miss this. And actually, David here is, is being a little cheeky. You know, if God has given us his perfect revelation, he's given us his law, how is it that we can then say, oh, you know, you declare me innocent from hidden faults, and you keep me away from presumptuous sins? You know, surely, if God has already revealed his will for us, then actually we should be sort of trying to work ourselves out and saying, oh, you know, I don't have innocent sins, innocent faults, sorry, hidden faults. Or we should be saying, well, you know, I'm not going to commit those presumptuous sins. And yet, David here says that these things come from the law of God and are in fact the gift from God. And it's all, you know, if we link it all back, it comes from this idea that the fear of the Lord is clean. It comes from God. This is incredible. That God doesn't just reveal himself to us, but he works in us so that we can be sanctified by his word. God's word is much better than any gold and much sweeter than honey. But the fact of the matter is, I think, as we look at our lives, we know that these things simply are not true for us. You know, so often we fail. You now, so often we look at God's word and we think, oh, what a chore. So often we look at God's word and just go, I don't understand any of this. And so often we live our daily lives and we know, don't we, that we fall under all the righteous standards that God's laws give to us. So how can we possibly pray these things for ourselves? How can we come to God and, you know, in the great tradition in Presbyterianism, sing this psalm for ourselves? The fact is, we must rely on our Lord Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. In his incarnation, he came as the perfect man. He came as a human being. And so he came into the world as part of the natural revelation to God's people. Not only that, he came and he understood and he taught and he lived the laws perfectly, unlike any human teacher before him. And so he embodied the special revelation of God for us. He died the death that we deserve so that we may be declared innocent and acceptable to God. And then he sends his Holy Spirit so that as we're united to Christ in him, spiritually we are then empowered to be restrained from presumptuous sin. So it's Jesus and all his works that enable us to do these things. To be declared innocent from hidden faults. To be kept back from presumptuous sins. And for us to be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Now, what does this mean for us today then? If you're here and you're not a Christian, um, maybe, just maybe, you're feeling some of that tug of the cognitive dissonance that I was talking about earlier. That actually you know that there is something in the way you look at this world that just doesn't stack up. In which case, can I commend to you the Bible and all God's teachings? This will put you at rest. This would give you a home 
with which to see the world. And you no longer have to be afraid of the mass of confusion that is out there. But come, taste God's word because it is sweet. And your life will be transformed. Now, if we're a Christian, how often do we have a low approach and an unworthy attitude to not just God's special revelation, but God's general revelation? Now, how often, you know, I I used to work in an office, I know. How often do we sit at the office desk and just think, this is just another day at the office. There is nothing to praise God for here. I'll praise God when I do my quiet time while I go to church. But actually, you know, the fact that you have a desk, that's God's general revelation. The fact that God has made human beings with brains that can come up with something as remarkable as a computer or your smartphone, that's amazing. But more than that, I think it's actually really worth Christians' while to just get out into the countryside once in a while. To see the beautiful, raw creation of God and just marvel and marvel at his greatness. If you're Scottish, you're very, very lucky. For the rest of us, we we, we just got to go find somewhere that will do that for us. But how often, actually, if we're going to be honest, we have a low view of God's special revelation. We come to God's word and, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's 6.30 in the morning. I need to do my quiet time before I head out to work, etc. And you just breeze straight through it. And you kind of think, oh, I, I know this stuff. And it's just one more thing to tick off on my to-do list. Now, can I just recommend to you then that even if it's just for this week, have verses 7 to 11. Just, just copied out as you know, a bookmark for your Bible or something. Be reminded that actually being able to read God's word is an amazing privilege. And in the reading of God's word, we can have total rest because he is true, he is pure, he is clean, and he is amazing and he makes wise the simple. He makes our heart rejoice and he enlightens the eyes. Just be reminded of that every day of this week. Maybe you're a mature Christian. Maybe these things are true for you. And as we read it, all you had in your heart was a hearty amen. Brilliant. Excellent. Share that perspective with those around you. Encourage them. Help them grow in their faith so that they too, like you, can sing a hearty amen when they read verses like this and praise God for his amazing revelation to us. And how about you individually tonight then? You know, as you head off to work on Monday, uh, maybe as you sit in your study, what can you do to be more attuned to God's general revelation or God's special revelation. I'll give you 10 seconds to think about it and then we'll pray.